Hi, folks. This is Harold Ree of the Paw Print Animal Rescue Podcast. We're excited to bring you Eric O'Gray. He's a subject of a six-minute video that went viral. We're talking 33 million views and counting. We'll just want to give you two things. On Tuesday, April 26th, Eric and his dog Jake will be on the Rachel Ray Show. Very, very exciting news on Tuesday, April 26th. In addition, if you want to submit your story to mutualrescue.org, the deadline for that is Saturday, April 30th. So we got two things going on, Rachel Ray on Tuesday, April 26th, and the deadline for Mutual Rescue, submit your own story, Saturday, April 30th. Thanks a lot for listening to Paw Print and on to the show. My name is Eric O'Gray, and if I could be any animal, I'd be a dog. Just because they're so full of love and everything about them is just so unconditional and giving, it seems to me that they were put on Earth to be paired up with people. This is Paw Print, an animal rescue community. Episode 34. I'm Harold Ree. And I'm Nancy Ree. Today's guest is the wonderful Eric O'Gray. Eric O'Gray, in 2010, weighed 320 pounds. He adopted a dog named Petey and proceeded to lose 140 pounds, totally transforming his health and his life. Fast forward and a video was created about the journey of Eric and Petey. It's an emotional story and already it's achieved 33 million views and counting. If you want to learn more about Eric and Petey and Jake and Mutual Rescue, Go to our show notes at thisispawprint.com slash 34. That's the number 34. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I was born in San Francisco General Hospital and uh, originally started out in public housing in San Francisco. Migrated to South San Francisco and then San Bruno, where I went to high school in San Bruno. Joined the Army when I was 17, uh, spent some time overseas came back, started college at San Jose State University when I was 27, graduated from San Jose State, and then went to uh, Emory Law School. After a few years of pursuing a law career and decided I didn't like it, went back into sales, which had really the career that I had before I went to college, and have been uh, uh, happily in sales ever since. I moved from San Jose to Seattle in October 2014, and then to Spokane in uh, December. So I currently live in uh, Spokane, but I definitely miss the Bay Area. I moved up to Washington for a a change of employment. I now work for the Whirlpool Corporation, washers, dryers, refrigerators. And I'm uh, essentially the Maytag man for Eastern Washington (laughs) and Idaho. It's a great job. I work out of my home and I, I I serve our appliance dealers and general contractors and and other people that use washers, dryers, refrigerators, things like that on a wholesale level. Anything you miss about the Bay Area? I do. I really miss the running trails in the Bay Area and the fact that just about any weekend in the Bay Area, you can find one or more. You have your choice between one or more different half marathons. So when I lived in the Bay Area, I was running a half marathon most every weekend at least and then some fulls. But There's not quite the selection up here. There's still enough and there's still the trails up here are phenomenal. It's a great place to be for the outdoors. We're here to talk about animals. You want to maybe share the important animals in your life. Let me start with Petey, who passed away last March, March 2015. Petey came into my life in 2010 when I was uh, morbidly obese. I was somewhere between 320 and 340 pounds. You know, at 5'10", that, that's pretty big. My waist was about 52 inches. I was wearing size 4XL shirts, and I was taking insulin for type 2 diabetes. My cholesterol was 300 to 400. My blood pressure was off the charts. My doctor at the time told me that he expected I would be dead in the next five years, and he actually advised me to buy a cemetery plot because he said I, I would need one soon. I did some research. I was watching CNN and Wolf Blitzer was interviewing President Clinton and President Clinton came on talking about a plant-based diet. And that's something that I'd never heard of before because I tried everything that had ever been conceived on the uh, American market for different diet plans and schemes and books and you name it, I've tried it. And I'd never heard of that. And and this is in 2010, I actually Googled Clinton plant-based diet and there were zero hits. 
believe it or not. Wow. Now, if, if you Google that now, you'd get uh, hundreds of thousands of hits on Google. So that's how far things have come in the meantime. So as part of my research project to figure out what I could do, because I was at that point about a month away from bariatric surgery that I'd had scheduled, and I wanted to avoid that if possible. So it was one last ditch effort. And I consulted with a naturopathic doctor and her name is Dr. Preeti Kolkarni. She is in Cupertino, California. One of the first things she recommended after she talked to me was that I should go out and adopt a pet from a shelter, a dog specifically. I'd never had a pet before. So I asked her, you know, well, why can't I just get a cat? And she said, have you ever tried to walk a cat? <laughs> And I said, no, but I think I've seen it done on TV. And she just kind of like glared at me in a very serious way. And all my medical problems were related to my obesity. And my obesity was related to the fact that I'd become very reclusive. I had stopped going outside. I'd stopped attempting to maintain friendships. And I was just sitting in my home, becoming further and further withdrawn from society. And the way that I try to explain it is that it's like a snowball rolling downhill. The further you go downhill, the bigger you get. And then you get to a circumstance that it is so miserable just existing. Being that big, it's like trying to put pants on an apple. There just nothing is designed to fit a large person. Every bone and joint in your body aches constantly. You just feel miserable. You have pains in your legs. It's just not a fun existence. And the larger you get, the worse that becomes and the less that you want to go outside and the less interactive you become with others. It's a, a dooming situation. Her reason for prescribing uh, the shelter dog for me was twofold. First, it would force me to go outside and get some exercise because I would be required to walk the dog at least a half an hour twice a day. So there'd be physical exercise associated with that and would also force me to go outside, which I'd stop doing. Then the second part would be to, because I had become so withdrawn, I would be required to have an emotional bond with, with another creature, which is something that I had lacked and I really hadn't had. At that point in my life, I hadn't been on a date in 15 years and I'd, I'd become, I felt like invisible. Well, sometimes invisible, nobody really wanted anything to do with me, but at the same time, I was highly visible due to my size. So did some internet searches. I found the Humane Society Silicon Valley because I was living in San Jose at the time. And as part of looking through this, I had all these visions of the perfect dog in my mind. I was gonna get a dog that was nice and cooperative and didn't need any training and was really a, a perfect dog and a small one, one that didn't shed and didn't have any sort of allergies or any sort of conditions that would need. And, you know, I guess what I had in my mind, what I was picturing was maybe a, an eight pound golden retriever. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously such a thing doesn't exist. So I called Humane Society Silicon Valley after looking at their website. And what I told the person on the phone that I wanted in their intake department, because they do just a wonderful job qualifying people and trying to place the right person with the right animal and I really appreciated their qualification process. So I told them that what I wanted to do was adopt an obese middle-aged dog so that we would have something in common. Mm -hmm. And she told me to come down, Cassandra Cruz of the Humane Society Silicon Valley told me to come down because she felt that she had the perfect dog for me. So I'm going down there with this vision of this eight pound golden retriever in my mind. And I get there into the, uh, uh, the intake meeting room and she walks in Petey. And Petey was 75 to 80-ish pounds at the time. He was just so sad looking. His, his head drooped and he looked down on the floor and his shoulders drooped and he just wasn't a happy dog. And he had some skin conditions and he was just, I could tell he, he was pretty overweight. But what really got me was he looked up at me and in his eyes, I could tell that he was equally disappointed at the person that he was looking at. I wasn't like what he was expecting either. So we both kind of like looked at each other with a, an oh really look. We sat down and I tried to uh, uh, meet him and socialize with him. And he was very standoffish and very untrusting. Cassandra and I agreed that what I would do is I'd go home and sleep on it 
She felt that, and she gave me, reiterated all the reasons why she thought that Petey would be the perfect dog for me because I lived by myself and he was kind of a special needs dog and he needed somebody who would be dedicated to him and who had to protect the person and both of us needed love. So Petey was a dog she felt was perfect for me. So I went home that night and I thought about it and I thought, it's not what I had in mind. He's not what I had in mind. He's not what I expected, but... I agree. I mean, how could I possibly have more in common with an animal? We're both untrusting and we're both in the same kind of physical conditions and perhaps we can do this together. So I went back the next day and I adopted Petey and we went to my home and we spent the first couple days. He kind of kept to his side of the room and, and I kept to the couch and, you know, he, he was kind of like looking at me expecting another shoe to drop or, you know, what's going to happen next. And then on the third night, he jumped up uh, in bed with me, and after that, he never slept on the floor again. And we, wow. slowly but surely, over the next several weeks, became inseparable and best friends. Petey had had a rough life, and this was this was his second time in a shelter. His first time in a shelter, according to the notes from uh, Silicon Valley Humane, was he was adopted out of a shelter when he was a puppy, and then again from uh, Silicon Valley Humane. So. I felt that I wanted to give him the best possible life for whatever. He was seven when I adopted him, and I decided that I wanted to give him just a, an incredible, fascinating life and to do things that most dogs would not be allowed to do. So I got a, uh, an emotional support animal prescription, which allowed me to take Petey everywhere that I went. So we went to the supermarket and we went to amusement parks and we went everywhere that dogs weren't supposed to go because I wanted him to see everything that I was seeing and experiencing. So he had a great and wonderful time. And as part of this process, by walking Petey for a half an hour twice a day and by just having him do stuff with me, he gave me the self-confidence to stick to the, uh, the nutrition plan that had been described for me by Dr. Preeti. I started losing three to five pounds every week, just Whoa. boom, 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 every week. And in, um, in 10 months, I'd lost 140 pounds. Wow. My life changed and Petey lost about 25 pounds. So he became really fit and a really attractive dog. I mean, his attitude improved, mine did also. We both became very happy and he really changed my life. I'd been on about $1,000 worth of medications a month, and that was that's what I was paying, and I have no idea what my employer was paying on top of that. I mean, all this stuff is really expensive. I got off insulin, my type 2 diabetes was reversed, my blood pressure went down to about 100 over 60, which is kind of like athlete's level. My cholesterol went down from between three and 400 to 118. I got off all meds. The only thing that I had in my medicine cabinet was Advil. I was a fat kid. My nickname as a child was, was Pudge. So I had become somewhat isolated for a time and learned how to do things myself and read books at a young age rather than attempting to socialize with the neighborhood children. But I lost a, a little bit of weight when I went to the army. I was infantry, so it's a fairly intense physical activity. So I actually trimmed up somewhat in the infantry. But the thing is, you can get away with doing a lot of stuff when you're younger that catches up to you and has a much greater impact on you when you're older. It's just like when we're 18 years old, we can drink every night until two or three in the morning and if motivated, still get up for work at eight o'clock the next morning. And it becomes harder and harder and harder to do that as adults. The same thing with the progression of the negative effects that we get from lack of exercise and the standard American diet as an adult it becomes harder and harder and harder to overcome the excesses, the poor nutrition, and the lack of exercise as we age. A pound of fat is 3,500 calories. So it takes 3,500 calories to digest a pound of fat. And that's whether it's in you as lipid cells or you're just consuming a pound of fat. Let's talk about what a pound of fat is. A pound of fat is if you do something or don't do something that is going to cause an incremental gain or lack of consumption of 100 to 200 calories a day. So very tiny incremental things that you do in your life. Let's say 110 calories per day, which is a couple of Oreos, a half a bag of potato chips, or a walk down the block. 
let's say that you don't take that walk down the block or you eat that uh, half bag of a small bag of potato chips or eat those several Oreos and you don't do anything to offset that in one month's time that 110 calories per day becomes 3,500 calories which is a pound of fat mm. over the course of a year then that becomes 12 pounds extra that you you've put on and then over the course of a decade that's 120 pounds and that's about where I was so from between age 25 and 51 where I was at the time I had accumulated on a much slower and more gradual basis that 140 pounds just as I described and it's so insidious when you put it on that slowly but you just creep up and you creep up and you creep up you don't really notice it and you just start buying larger clothes and you just kind of like accept that that's what your life has become and then there you are you're over the edge you've gone beyond the tipping point and now you're you're in a health crisis from failing to maintain what you've done anybody who goes out and adopts a dog and just commits to walking that dog for a half an hour twice a day can largely avoid the place where I became and more importantly then they'll have that bond with a creature that is something greater than than I'd ever ever experienced in my case he showed me the meaning of complete and absolute unconditional love something I'd never experienced before and based upon what he showed me and what he made me feel I then felt love and friendship and became able to love myself and care about myself and want to live and want to be a great person for the first time in my life Petey believed that I was the greatest person in the world and then I basically decided that I wanted to become the person who he believed that I was that taught me to care more about myself and be selfless towards others so that cured the underlying cause of my obesity and my health problems because it caused me to want to care about myself and to care about others Wow I feel like your story is a classic case of that question who rescued who or is it whom yeah, who rescued whom home? would yeah. be proper grammar. <laughs> <laughs> who rescued whom? Right. Did um, I rescue him or did he rescue exactly, me? Exactly, exactly. And and that's what that's what the mutual rescue project that I'm involved with is is all about. In 2014, 358 billion dollars was given to charities in the US. But out of all that money, out of 358 billion dollars, less than 1% was given to animal related causes. So they're de-emphasizing charity towards animals and only doing it towards human-based causes. The project taken on by Humane Society Silicon Valley, the Mutual Rescue Project, is basically that connecting an animal with a person can have a transformative and profound impact on the lives of both the person and the animal. In my case, the way that I think about it is helping animals helps people. By the charity and goodness, I mean, of Humane Society Silicon Valley and what they did, had they not been there for me and had they not paired me with Petey and had they not had a really special intake process that really tried to uh, pair the, the best person with the best animal, I don't know that I'd be alive today and I don't know that I would have achieved the results that I did. If everybody can remember that in their giving, as we know, there are 13,000 different independent animal rescue organizations, shelters, local humane societies all over the United States a lot of times when they do donate for animals and they think that they're going to give it to a national organization, for example, the Humane Society of the U.S. Well, as you know, the Humane Society of the U.S. is more of a lobbying organization. None of the money that they get trickles down to the local shelters and rescue organizations. So the best way to help animals in your community is to give to the shelters and the humane societies, the independent hum humane societies, and the, the rescue organizations in your community. That's how you're actually helping animals, and that's how you're helping animals help people like me. Right, right. But also, I mean, we, we have to give the National Humane Society credit for, you know, trying to change laws. Like, I personally would like to see breeders more heavily regulated, but oh, you know, they take up that kind of cause, too. So we got to give most, them credit for that. Most definitely. And they're, they're a wonderful organization, and they're, they, they do accomplish a lot of positive good and, and great things. Uh, I'm just saying that, unfortunately, people overlook the local efforts a lot of times. Right, right. Because no, there's, there's confusion about the national and the mm -hmm. local organizations. Yeah. Petey 
obviously literally saved your health. How did he improve your social life? That's something that happened to me. I made my best friends by uh, meeting them on the trails while I was walking my dog. Absolutely. So it turns out that uh, Petey ended up being a, a babe magnet. <laughs> <laughs> so I had gone from a, a place in my life that I hadn't really been on a date for 15 years and I was shy and reserved and uh, not really know how to approach people. And then Petey would just open up and we would meet people and women, I think, would notice me and I felt attractive for the first time in my life. And especially like people that had other dogs, I did started going on dates and most of my dates, interestingly, were with women who also had dogs. And many of them I met when, you know, we were walking dogs and we just kind of like ran into each other and our dogs began playing together and we just struck up a conversation. So Petey was your wingman, basically. <laughs> Absolutely. Rescuing was, dogs is sexy. <laughs> yeah. And he was great at that also. Women just love Petey. He really genuinely liked women and uh, it was just a, a great situation. When you consider plant-based diet, vegan lifestyle, all that, kind of the first reaction is, boy, going vegetarian or vegan, it's like nothing's delicious. What would you say to that? You know, here's what happened. So I went plant-based at age 51, never, to the best of my knowledge, I'd never had a single meal in my entire life that didn't include meat or dairy ever, not one in my life. Everything that I had been eating at the time was either fast food or delivered to my door or something like that. And, you know, I was eating like pizza and, and just not healthy stuff for the most part. So it was a very striking transition for me to go from that to whole foods plant-based. And the difference is whole foods are things that came out of the ground. So you're, you're preparing things the way that they came out of the ground rather than buying things in boxes and containers from stores mm. is the big difference. You can buy vegan junk food that is really not going to make you... Yeah, potato chips and breadsticks are vegan or can be vegan, but not necessarily the healthiest. So. Coconut-based ice cream, you know, you mm. can eat a thousand calories easily, no problem. Right. So, so the difference was when you stick to it and you have an open mind, your palate changes. It's just like if you're used to putting a lot of salt on your food and then you stop putting a lot of salt on your food, at first you miss it, but then slowly you don't miss it anymore and, and you're okay with the difference and the natural flavors of food start to come out and they, they start to taste good. So a lot of people don't understand. They think that somebody on a plant-based diet is, is all about eating twigs and lettuce and it's not. The foods that I eat look like in every way the foods that other people eat that are omnivores, except mine just don't include meat and dairy. Like, let me give you some examples. I eat a lot of Mexican food and you can go to any Mexican restaurant and just tell them to leave off the meat and the cheese and add extra rice and beans. And in those rice and beans, there's going to be the full spectrum of amino acids, including all the essential amino acids in roughly the same proportions as steak in between that, that serving of rice and beans, but you're not getting the baggage of cholesterol, the uh, triglycerides, the fats, and everything else with it. You're getting just the good protein and not all the other junk that comes along with it. So over a period of time, I, I make lasagnas. It's one of my favorite uh, plant-based food is, is Thai food. And a lot of the, uh, the cultures, and especially in the Bay Area, gosh, I mean, there's so many places you can eat. There's so many different, like, great restaurants. It's just probably the greatest restaurant area of the country. After a while, you don't miss it anymore. And the thought of eating animals becomes repulsive after a while. So you go through a transition process where initially you, you do kind of have a craving, but then the craving goes away. And then after a while, Sometimes people try to tease you as, as uh, somebody on a plant-based diet and say that, you know, oh, don't you wish you could be eating this? And my standard response is no, I, I don't. That no longer has any appeal to me of any kind. I now like what I eat much better than what I used to eat. And I feel so much cleaner, so much happier. I have so much more energy. My energy's off the charts. I sleep seven hours a night. I can run 10 to 15 miles a day if I want. And I, I just have tremendous mental clarity. I'm going to be 57 this year. I feel like I'm 25 years old and I can compete athletically against 25 year olds. Those are the, the good things that you get from a, a plant-based diet. 
thanks for sharing that. Appreciate that. You're well known, whether it's social media, all that, videos of you that have literally millions, tens of millions of, of views. It's been an amazing, an amazing journey. It really has. When I lived in the Bay Area, I maintained contact with the Humane Society Silicon Valley. And, you know, they knew of me and they knew of my story and they knew of my weight loss transition. And one of the uh, people that they have on staff, Finnegan, just does an amazing job with her blog. She writes just the funniest stuff. She did a piece that went viral called Eddie the Terrible. And it was about a, a chihuahua that a special needs oh, chihuahua. Oh, yeah, I remember that. that. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. So this is, this is the same lady and she's just awesome. And I love her. And so I wrote to her and I said, wow, that was just a beautiful piece. And we struck up a conversation and one thing led to another. And she, she, you know, we talked on the phone and she was going to do a blog article or something about me. She took down all my information. She was contacted by the Oprah magazine, O Magazine, last July, September or something like that. Do you know anybody with a story about how an animal has changed their life because they were doing a feature edition on that. So she she connected them to me and I talked to them and they published my story in the Oprah magazine in November. So their Thanksgiving edition, all the, the amazing positive changes that Petey had in my life after I experienced true unconditional love and friendship for the first time in my life that allowed me to change and correct the underlying uh, cause of my obesity. So then they had the idea to put together this mutual rescue organization, which is intended to help shelters on a local level. And they, they decided that uh, one of the best ways to do this was to do like a proof of concept with an initial short film of somebody that had really benefited from one of the dogs that had been adopted from their shelter. They asked me if I'd be interested in participating in the project. And I said, yes, that sounds like something I'd really love to do. And the next thing I knew, they, they flew a, a film crew from Chicago to where I live in Spokane. We spent two days filming. These guys were amazing. I mean, it was just amazing equipment, just stuff that I'd never seen before. They had overhead drones and just all this fascinating stuff. To the point that somebody in my neighborhood started a rumor with all this stuff that was going on, and all, these, all this equipment and all these cameras and everything, that I was an astronaut. I don't know who started the work. <laughs> so ever since then, every time that I walk Petey... That also helps with the women, I've heard. It's telling yeah. folks that you're an astronaut. All these little kids run up to me and Petey asking the next time he's going to go to the moon. <laughs> so it's really cute. I became like a local celebrity in the neighborhood because of that. These guys were just amazing, the work that they did. And that uh, distilled down to a six-minute film. So the six-minute film was put on the internet on Valentine's Day as a story of unconditional love. And at first it took off slowly, but then it got picked up by SFGate. And as of today, it has over 30 million views on SFGate. Wow. So it really went viral everywhere else and all over the internet. I appeared on the Rachel Ray Show with Jake last week. They flew uh, me and Jake to New York. We both had uh, uh, seats in the airplane. Oh, is that the picture? Yeah, so yeah, Jake's, yeah. A, yeah, Jake's a Labrador retriever. So after uh -huh. Petey died, after Petey died, it went about six months without a dog. And I was just so broken up. And I just, it was just the most significant loss that I'd ever experienced. And I met somebody as part of that process who told me that when a new dog was looking for me, I would know it. And sure enough, about three months later, after I talked to that person, I'd finished a, a race in Seattle. Uh, it's like a 10K race that I did in Seattle. And I finished it. And right when I was crossing the finish line, I got this just really overwhelmingly powerful urge to go to Seattle Humane. And just like right then, so I drove there still with my race number on and, and everything, you know, all the salt crust on my face and everything. Four minutes earlier, Jake had been put into an adoption pen. He wasn't on the internet yet. His picture hadn't even been taken and put on the wall. When I saw him... And he saw me, it was like we instantly recognized each other. He cocked his head, he turned his head sideways with a look on his face that was like, dude, let's get out of here. I said, I'll take him. And half an hour later, he was in my car and we were going home. And the next day we were running and we've been best friends ever since. Wow. Yeah. I follow a ton of animal rescue accounts. And so I'm constantly bombarded with rescue stories. But there was something about your story that was just really amazing. 
I'm not trying to say that I'm special or anything because I'm not. A lot of people have asked me about this. Why has your story become so viral? And I, I think it's a combination of a number of different things. There's a lot of weight loss stories. So a lot of people have lost weight doing various different things. Well, that's part of it. But it goes to also somebody kind of like rising from the ashes. It's a little bit of Rocky, a little bit of Cinderella. It's also talking about how to benefit nonprofit organizations that, that help animals. We all want a comeback story, and, and your story is, is a tremendous comeback, right? Yeah, so it, it combines all those things. And so because the story became so viral and so successful, I'm in an MBA program, a marketing program, how to try to you know influence things. And I've got to say that for the impressions and the reach that they got out of this video, this has to be single-handedly one of the most successful advertising programs in the history of the advertising industry. <laughs> so it doesn't just stop with me though. One of the other things that they're trying to do is to get other people to solicit stories, other people who have had animals in their lives that have influenced them and really made a difference in their life. If they could go to mutualrescue.org and submit their own story, a distinguished panel of judges is going to be reviewing all of the entries. And so far they've got about 200. Out of all the entries submitted, four are going to be selected by you know celebrity judges. And those four are also going to be made into videos like mine. And then in November, pardon me, in September at the uh, Flint Center at De Anza College, there's going to be a film festival of these videos for about 1,700 invited guests. And then they're all going to be shown to the world at the same time. And uh, hopefully this initiative is going to be launched on a, a national basis. And we're going to try to help a lot of animals. You know, that notion of mutual rescue, that cannot be emphasized enough because I work for the Humane Society and we don't, we have a cat shelter, but we do not have a, a dog shelter. All our dogs are in foster homes. Mm -hmm. And so we're always constantly trying to recruit new fosters and people always tell you, oh, I would love to save a dog, but I'm too busy or, you know. And As you, if the dog, the rescuing a dog will become a drain on their time and resources when it's the exact opposite. They'll remind right. you what's important in your life. Absolutely. And they'll remind you, they'll connect you with the world better. They'll believe in you. And there's just something that's reflected in the eyes of a dog that causes me to become a much better person, a much better man in every aspect of my life. Yeah, exactly. It's not something that you can explain to somebody until they experience it. But I, I know that in the case of your shelter, without without the dog pens, I mean, it, it's difficult for you to arrange the adoptions because people can't just like come in and see what dogs yeah. that you have. You have to try to, you know, pair people and then coordinate two schedules. It's it's almost like a, a barter system, and then it's just a lot more difficult for you. Yeah, and despite the challenges, our fosters are just amazing people because they know what rescuing a pet, you know, how it influences their life and the positive influence that comes in their direction also. We have a couple questions from our, our listeners. Okay. One question comes from uh, Trisha Yacht. She actually has a dog who is, sounds like towards the end of life. How'd you deal with the death of Petey? There is some good practical information that I can share also. So when I found out, uh, I, I had no idea that there was anything wrong with Petey. And I had no idea that he had a massive cancer in his abdomen. I just didn't wow. know because he was a larger breed dog and it just, it didn't show on him at all. I was at a business trip and somebody was watching him for me and they called me and they said that Petey had stopped eating and he stopped drinking water. Then I asked them immediately to put, you know, bring him to a vet. They determined that he had a huge inoperable mass on him and he was probably going to die in, you know, in a very short period of time. So I flew home. I just spent the next three days on the floor with him uh, because he cried when the lights were turned out because he didn't want to feel like he was alone. Mm. So I just kept the lights on and I just spent, you know, three days on the floor with him uh, with a wet washcloth pressing water to his lips for moisture. And there are end of life dog hospice places that you can call. The one that I used was a uh, lap of love. So I knew that Petey was just coming down to the end and he wasn't going to live much longer because it, it, it just was apparent. So I called Lap of Love and they actually had a veterinarian on the way to help me. And Petey died before the veterinarian got there. The thing that I'm, I'm happiest most about was he had a conscious death 
he was looking in my eyes when he died and he shuddered and I just saw the life come out of him. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, if you know that your dog's dying, you need to prepare and, and have somebody call a service like that. And it's really not that bad. It's two or 300 bucks that they'll come out, help you at the final stage of your dog dying and they'll help with the cremation or whatever you want to do to, uh, to handle it once your dog passes away. So look on the internet for dog hospice, end of life, or just uh, like lap of love is the uh, website on the internet. One question from another one of our listeners, Bob Wakely, is actually exercise related. He loved your story, was very moved by it. Exercise and owning a dog, if you could do it over again, would you always recommend ad adopting a dog and to get you motivated and exercise? Yeah, it, it's like I said, for two different things. If you're in a point in your life that your life has gotten out of control physically and you need to either reconnect with the world, um, uh, you know, for mental health reasons, or you just need to lose weight, the dog will force you. If, if you do what you're supposed to do and you do right by the dog, you're going to go out and walk that dog for half an hour, twice a day. And doing that is light to moderate ex exercise. Your metabolism won't work correctly unless you get light to moderate exercise most every day. So a dog for that is extremely important. Another way to look at it is if you have a dog and you don't want to become obese, it's, it's that 100 to 200 calories a day that I started talking about, I, I've already talked about, you're going to get that extra and then you're not going to get that insidious incremental buildup of uh, extra weight that you would otherwise. So in my case, uh, PD wasn't really a runner. He was a walker. So we did a little bit of very short distance running. But when I adopted Jake, I was specifically after a dog that could run over 10 miles. And the great thing about Jake is he's a combination of Labrador and Rhodesian, which are is a dog that, you know, he could do half marathons with me, no problem. Mm -hmm. So I was really lucky that way. So in looking at it, it's important to pick the dog based upon the level of physical activity that you're going to expect. Don't get more than you want, because if you get a dog like I did that wants to run six to 10 miles a day, you really got to do that with them. And if you change your mind and you become lazy and decide that, well, you don't, well, that's too bad. You still have to do it. So that's one way. But like if somebody that just wants a smaller dog to walk with, any small dog that you get is going to be able to walk for half an hour twice a day and get you the minimal exercise that you need for your metabolism to work correctly. It's been, what, about a year since Petey's death. When you think of him, what comes to mind? I'm glad that you asked that. I think that heaven is going to be all the dogs. And to get in, you need a dog that has really loved you and is going to vouch for you. The dogs are all going to be waiting for us when we leave this earth. And that's what I believe. We're going to share the videos, the various articles written about you. What are some other ways folks can either get in touch, can really look you up and, and learn more about your story? My website is ericandpeety.com. That's E-R-I-C-A-N-D-P-E-E-T-Y.com. And that just has a little bit of my biography a lot of the different appearances that I've done, the articles that I've uh, been in and participated in, some of the uh, the news stories. So it lists all those out so people can look at them. And it also has my upcoming appearance schedule. My side gig is uh, inspirational and keynote speaker. And that's one thing that I'm, I'm trying to do. If anybody needs a, an inspirational or keynote speaker, if they can contact me through my website, I'd be glad to discuss that with them. If you could wave a magic wand and change anything, any one thing in the state of animal rescue as it is right now, what would that be? I would wave a magic wand and make every homeless animal in the world get adopted today. And that way, everybody working at all these animal shelters could have the rest of the week off. <laughs> clear the shelters. Amen yeah. to that. Yeah. I have a, a presentation that I do called Achieving the Impossible based upon goal setting and project management. And how do you get from something that's a seemingly insurmountable, impossible situation, which is point A, to becoming the most awesome person that you've ever wanted to be, if that's your goal, which is point B, and then breaking that down into a series of steps. So nothing is too big to overcome, and you can overcome anything that you set your mind to 
you just have to break it down into steps and then just work on each individual step. So don't look at the big impossible part. Look at all the little different things that you can do that you can work on one at a time and that will add up to achieve the ultimate goal that you want to achieve. We want to say thank you to Eric O'Gray for sharing his inspirational story. And don't forget, if you're listening on the day of release, Tuesday, April 26th, Eric will be on The Rachel Ray Show. And Saturday, April 30th, is your deadline to submit your story to Mutual Rescue. You can learn more by going to our show notes at thisispawprint.com slash 34. If you want to learn more about me and Nancy, you can find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Look for This Is Paw Print, all one word. If you want to listen to more episodes, you can find us on iTunes. Make sure that you hit subscribe to get the latest episodes immediately. SoundCloud, as well as Stitcher and Pocket Casts, a popular podcast app. We want to thank you, all of you, for sharing your stories. And we want to welcome listeners from Austin, Texas, Toledo, Ohio, and Burlington, Vermont. You spread a positive message of love and peace by saving an animal. Have a great day, everyone, and see you next time on Paw Print. Paw Print is a production of EVER Education. You can handle the truth. Woo!